Any question about yesterday? Something that you did not see during the lecture you want to discuss now? Hmm? Okay, so the next topic I wanted to discuss about is uh, parametric optimization. And uh, I very, very slightly approached the. Yep. Did you put it in the wrong folder again? It's not showing up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. <laughs> My mistake. Wait, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see it now? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, okay, parametric optimization. Uh, so I, I very slightly approached the question actually in the KKD chapter where I mentioned, well, you may have parameters entering inside your problem. And the questions behind parametric optimization is uh, what will happen to your solution and your cost function when you change your parameters around. So can, uh, we'll discuss essentially NLPs, which again can definitely come from optimal control where uh, you would have uh, some parameters here that enter in the problem. And they can really enter anywhere in the cost or in the constraints on, or both um, in any possible way. <coughs> and so we optimize over W and P is something like given from the outside if you want. You can think of that in a, in a real system like it could be masses and stiffness and some constant in your model, for example. Um, anything you want, but that's something that like a data that is given. And then what we'll discuss is um, what happens. So obviously for a given parameter, you get a solution, you get, get a cost corresponding to your problem. But what's gonna happen when uh, we change these parameters uh, on what will happen to the solution and so on. Uh, and this kind of questions, so, so first they are quite deep, so uh, the lecture is a bit long, uh, and I'll stay on the surface on the, on the applications. Our entire books on this topic, discussing all the properties that you have. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, this stuff is extremely useful in a number of applications. Uh, I'll, I'll show you one uh, at the end uh, where we use this concept to do uh, funny stuff. Uh, but the bottom line is if you, uh, for example, want to understand what would be the impact of changing some parameters in your system on the behavior of the system in terms of optimal control. These are the tools you should look at. All right, so pretty big menu. Um, we'll uh, probably finish in the afternoon, I, I suspect. Um, so I showed you this slide actually a few weeks ago. Uh, so that's what we'll discuss. So you have this bunch of parameters P entering in the problem. Can be a vector, can be anything. And um, you have to imagine that when you solve this problem for a given P, you get the W, the solution. You also get the dual solution, the lambdas and the mu's. And you will have a cost that corresponds to this, um, this P. And if you change the P, all these things are likely to change. And what we will do behind uh, this project optimization is try to understand how changing P affects uh, the cost and, uh, and um, solution. And why we do that, uh, there are a number of applications, fast metric studies, understanding how the parameters affect your uh, optimal control solution, for example. Um, you can uh, easily study, uh, approximate, um, well, the effect of stochastic parameters, for example, on the solution in an approximate way. For example, if P is distributed according to something, uh, you can uh, study via this the, the effect of, uh, of changing P on the solution, for example. Homotopies, I don't know if you heard about this term in optimization. No? That's a very useful trick when you have really, really difficult problems to solve. Uh, and we use it in some applications where uh, essentially solving the optimal control problem in one shot is impossible. 
you never get uh, good enough initial guess and the problem is way too non-linear and non-convex. So what we do instead, we first form an easier optimal control problem um, that we can solve and, uh, and uh, we transform this problem into the real problem we want to solve via a parameter that we adjust. You can think of a parameter going from 0 to 1, 0 being a simple problem and 1 being the real problem. Then you solve for 0 and, uh, and then you, you uh, crank up this parameter very slowly, resolving the problem all the time. And you can reshape your solution from the, sim the simple problem to the complex one. So if you are suspecting you have a very, very difficult problem, we can discuss uh, how to implement these things. Um, whenever you do um, multi-level optimization, for example, if you want to start nesting optimization problems within uh, another, one example of that would be um, I have a system where I want to optimize the parameters, for example. Um, and I want these parameters to be optimum for a number of configurations um, of the system. So you'd have something like uh, maybe, uh, think of this for example, you solve your problem for a number of cases. <coughs> um, for different uh, set of parameters. They could be, for example, uh, operating your system in a few different configurations, like a UAV, different uh, wind velocity. Why not for a flying from A to B? And then um, you wonder, um, uh, how can I optimize these different systems or this different configuration um, such that, for example, in average, um, my, uh, my um, performance is, uh, is uh, as good as possible. So that will be different solutions. And then, for example, you want to tune the parameters of your system so that it's, uh, such that it's, it's good in different configurations. That's an example of bi-level optimization. Uh, so you use this type of uh, parametric approaches in this context. I'll show you uh, some examples a bit later. Also, when you do real-time NMPC, so based on these ideas as well, uh, how you can uh, go for very high speed. Oh yeah, I uh, describe here a little bit homotopies. Uh, it's like you build a, a problem that is easy to solve for uh, your parameter being zero. And for P is one, you have the actual problem you want to solve. And then you toggle from zero to one slowly. All right, so we discussed this guy already. Probably I should uh, recall what we did there. <coughs> so the first question you can ask, and that's the easy question actually. Um, if, so this is your NLP with a parameter P, and if you solve that, you will get uh, a solution W, and you will get the resulting cost. So your phi evaluated, evaluated at the optimal solution W star and for the corresponding P, that's the cost and let's call it V of P. Okay, you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, you can think of uh, V of P equals phi of W star. Solution of the problem is a function of P and P. Um, <coughs> And obviously, if you change P, you may change um, the optimum of this problem. So W may change, P will change, and phi will, may change accordingly. And so V is a function of P. And uh, you can ask a, a few different questions. So first, is V continuous? The answer is yes. The second question is, is V uh, differentiable? So can I compute the der derivative of this guy? Um, and that's the kind of things we, for example, use in uh, bi-level optimization, um, where you may, for example, do like, okay, I can solve my optima optimal control problem, and then I'm going to try to find the parameters P that make this problem as good as possible. So you could decompose uh, solving uh, over W and P the problem. 
you could do that, but you could also form a um, parametric NLP. You optimize only over W with your constraints, and then you form another problem where you minimize uh, over P. So you could uh, separate this problem in two levels, and that's useful in a number of contexts. Okay, so is V of P differentiable? Uh, as usual, that's going to be the same uh, everywhere here. Yes, but you need some conditions to be satisfied. And here is a very simple theorem that tells you how this uh, V of P behaves. Um, and here is the, the bottom line. So it's differentiable uh, if you don't have any weakly active constraints, essentially. Uh, and we'll see that when a constraint becomes weakly active, something happens. Um, and it's differentiable and the derivative of this V with respect to P has a surprisingly simple form. And that's uh, the derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to P. And it's really not obvious. You need to do a bit of math to get to that answer. It's not very hard, but it's uh, not uh, straightforward. Um, and it's kind of a surprising answer. That means, essentially, uh, if I give you an NLP, as complex as it is, and I'm asking you how will, that change the, how will that change the cost if I change the parameter and resolve the problem, get the new W, so as you can think that's a pretty complex machinery. The answer to that question is, uh, is straightforward. You essentially assemble your Lagrange function. So as usual, it's... Uh, uh, this stuff. Um, you have this. And then all you have to do is take the partial derivative of this Lagrange function with respect to P, right? So you don't need to do any strange computations. You just assemble these different things and uh, evaluate them at your solution. Um, that would be, yeah, that would work. That's uh, del H del P. And you evaluate that uh, at um, your solution, W star, for your given P. And you need your lambda star, the, the dual solution, and mu star, and so on. So you plug these values in these functions. And uh, this gives you um, the derivative of the cost with respect to the parameters. So very cheap to evaluate, no need of any uh, strange computations. And that's despite the fact that so W is implicitly a function of P because if you change P, you change W and then you assemble all these things inside the function. That doesn't matter. Uh, the how the cost, the optimal cost will change if you change P is simply even by that. Okay. Okay. So you've seen that illustration. Um, that's actually an LP, uh, a linear program. So the cost. You have these level curves that are like straight, and it's like basically like a plane that will basically move around. So I have some parameters that uh, will change my uh, the um, yeah the inclination of that plane and, and move the solutions around. So here, uh, the, the arrow is showing the, the gradient of the cost. So it's the ball wants to roll down here, and it's blocked by these constraints. And uh, so that's, that's an NLP, even though it's an LP, but uh, it's be par part of the NLP family. And I report here um, the cost I get from my problem <coughs> for these different P's. And so you see that it continues first. You don't have a jump in the cost, uh, and you see that it's made of uh, basically uh, piecewise um, bits in the, in the cost. And you see that some points are non-differentiable. This one, obviously, and there's one here. It's a little bit less obvious, and one here as well. So if I change my problem, um, here's what happens. So I'm, I'm moving through my, uh, my cost function. And at some point, you see what happens over this point here. So here it's not obvious, but there is one point where the cost is not differentiable. 
And what happened is that the active set has changed. So we moved from having these two constraints here active to uh, another corner in the polytope where these two constraints are active. Okay? And that will typically, not necessarily, but most often yield a um, non-differentiability in the cost function. And essentially, whenever you change the active set, there will be a point where you violate this condition. Right? It constrains to go from being strictly active to being inactive. In between, you'll pass through uh, weakly active. Just at the point where uh, the solution stops pushing against the constraints and before it, it kind of falls back and moves somewhere else. Same up here. Uh, here my uh, uh, solution will flip from going up to going down. And you have this uh, corner again in the cost function and so on and so forth. Okay. So at these points, uh, it's not differentiable, but you still have the notion of subgradients. So if you evaluate um, at this very point, you evaluate this gradient of Lagrange function, and you could do that by computing the solution uh, from the limit from the left and limit from the right. It's essentially computing uh, the solution um, using one active set or the other because the two are valid in some sense at that point. And if you do that, you would essentially get these two slopes. <coughs> so uh, at that point, the function is not differentiable, but you can still uh, easily compute the slopes on the two sides. Okay with that? Okay. Now, the slightly trickier question is, um, I put an argmin here, and I mean by that, now we'll look at the uh, solution to the problem instead of the cost. So the w as well, obviously, is a function of, uh, of p. And we'll try to understand uh, what happens to that guy. So same story as before. Um, so first, uh, w, it's, it's, it's a function of, uh, of p in really a mathematical sense of the term. So uh, even though w is given by a computer code and a Newton iteration or SQP or interior point, everything, you can still look at it as a mathematical function of p. Uh, the central tool for understanding how w changes with p will be the implicit function theorem. Uh, I think we discussed that in a previous lecture, yeah. You remember still this thing? Vaguely, maybe. I'll, uh, I'll recall what, how it works. Um, and then again, we'll essentially ask this kind of question. So is this solution a continuous function of p? Is it differentiable? If it's differentiable, how do we compute the sensitivities? Uh, by that we mean del w del p essentially. And one uh, thing you can do if you can compute that, for example, is to build uh, predictors uh, of uh, your solution. So say you solve the problem at p0 and uh, you want to uh, have a, a good guess of what the solution will be if you solve the problem at p, a different parameter, and you could form a, a first order Taylor expansion essentially. So take your solution at p0 and use this predictor style approach to build the next uh, w. Now I'll show you a few things, for example, path following. For example, if the parameter is changing continuously uh, and you want to keep track of how w is changing uh, as a result of p changing, uh, you have pretty efficient things you can do from uh, parametric optimization. Okay, so let's discuss that first. Um, so here is an example. That's a QP now. Um, so you have your cost function here, the free minimum down here, this uh, green stuff. And that's the solution of the QP blocked by the constraint. Um, and on this side, I report p down here, and the parameter will essentially move that uh, minimum. Um, and you see the two primal variables, w1 and w2 in uh, black and red. And so you see right away something, so they are continuous here, and, um, but they are not obviously not everywhere differentiable. So you see these uh, corners here uh, that pop up. Okay, here is a statement for WP. 
uh, and then you will have these uh, conditions uh, popping up everywhere, LICQ and strict SOSC. Um, so, essentially, if you solve your NLP at a given P, and at uh, this P, the solution satisfies LICQ and SOSC, um, then W as a function of P is continuous around that point, i.e., for example, here, I'm um, solving P at this point, it's LICQ SOSC, you don't necessarily see it, it can guess it from the, the picture, but uh, around that point my W is continuous. And we'll essentially see that at this point um, you will have a problem. So if you have a convex QP, for example, SOSC holds everywhere. Um, then you reach your discontinuities, uh, not, not discontinuities, uh, non-differentiabilities here. Um, and then you keep going. Um, yeah, so maybe I should specify here. Um, here we have a convex QP, so we satisfy SOS everywhere. If, you s if we satisfy LICQ on top of that, we have continuous uh, solutions. So they are actually <coughs> continuous throughout um, the different parameters P. Uh, and these points will... Uh, Maybe you suspect already match uh, changes of active sets. So if I move my parameter, it's going to move this point here. That's the way I designed this. And uh, the non-differentiable non points appear precisely when um, my constraint becomes weakly active here. So here the, the gradient of the cost will not push against the constraint. That's why you have a change of active set. Now it the constraint becomes inactive, and that's why you got a uh, non-differentiable point in the solution manifold. Go up here, touch the constraint again, and here, when we touch the constraint, change of active set, we also got a, um, a non-differentiability in the solution manifold. And here, same story, we touch a new constraint. We move from that one to that one. Okay, with that, um, here, another, here is another example about the uh, continuity of the solution. It's not necessarily continuous. Again, if you fail these things, uh, you may have a discontinuous solution. And a very easy case to see that is to form an LP. And, uh, well, we kind of saw that in the previous picture, but when you have changes of active set, uh, the solution actually jumping around. Uh, for example, here we move from this constraints to this ones, and this corresponds to a discontinuity in uh, in W of P. And what happens really, if you remember when we discussed uh, this question of uh, SOSC and ICQ, uh, to have SOSC on an LP, uh, you need uh, to have enough active constraints, essentially as many as you have degrees of freedom. So as soon as you move from one uh, active set to another, so for example, this constraints active to those ones, uh, just at this point where you jump, um, you have only, or say one constraint is weakly active and then um, your SOSC condition fails. And that's why um, uh, you have a jump in W of P. Okay with that? Okay, now we can talk about uh, the differentiability. So we talked about the continuity, and huh? that's the WFP jump. Now we can talk about can we differentiate um, uh, WFP. So obviously, visually from here, you can s guess that this is differentiable throughout here. <coughs> and here we have a problem, here we have a problem, and so on and so forth, here, here, and here. And um, again, it's a fairly simple statement. Uh, your W of P is uh, differentiable. You still need no weakly active constraints as for uh, the cost function, but you also need a LICQ and a SOSC uh, for your W of P to be differentiable. Uh, some people talk about the stability of the solution of the NLP, and by that they really just mean that uh, um, the solution in the neighborhood of P is uh, is well defined by the first order predictor, so it's not changing widely. Uh, I think it's a slightly misleading name, but you can see that in some papers. 
Okay, so we can go through this again now. So at this point here, uh, you have a change of uh, active set. Actually, you see very well here that you have a weakly active constraint because uh, no gradient is pushing against that constraint. And that typically yields a uh, non-differentiable point. So the gradient does not exist per se at that point. Uh, instead, you have subgradient. So you have one slope and one slope. And same for the QP. Here, well, it's obviously differentiable here, and there it's completely non-differentiable, it's discontinuous. In, in principle, you also have a gradient from the left and the right, uh, but uh, there's not much you can do from these guys. And that's the same story, uh, you violate uh, actually both points here at this uh, jump. <coughs> okay with that? Okay, so we'll try to um, understand how to uh, build this uh, sensitivities of so del w del p. So we, so we saw how to build the sensitivity of the cost function. That's very easy. Uh, building the del w del p. That's a little bit harder, but it's it's not uh, that extreme. And as usual, it's uh, easiest to start without inequality constraints. So can just discuss the case where you have uh, cost and uh, equality constraints. Uh, why? Because then you don't have this problem of uh, weak deactive constraints. We don't have to discuss that. So we can uh, start with this point of view. And then we ba will basically do uh, an application of the implicit function theorem on the Kegeli conditions. So for a problem like this, the Kegeli conditions, uh, they would read like that. So gradient of the Lagrange function with respect to w is zero and the constraints are zero. So if you solve these equations for w and lambda, <coughs> that will give you your primal dual solution for a given p. Of course, uh, w is a function of p, lambda, the dual variables, they will also be a function of p. They'll also change if you change p. Uh, so a quick reminder, implicit function theorem. Let's imagine you have a set of equations r uh, that implicitly define uh, the solutions Z. Z will be W and lambda and mu in the end uh, as a function of P. So that defines Z as a function of P implicitly via these relationships. Um, yeah, we'll essentially collect uh, the primal dual variables in Z, in Z and the Kegeli conditions in R. Uh, so the IFT uh, tells us that if uh, when you take uh, the say, gradient of R with respect to Z or Jacobian, uh, this matrix here is, if it, this matrix is full rank, um, then uh, we know that uh, locally Z is a continuous and differentiable function of P. So which uh, I note like this here. If you don't like this notation, just think of uh, Z as a function of P given by this R equals to zero and this function exists locally so you can in principle you could chart uh, a nice function z of p given through these equations uh, and this will be the case in the neighborhood what happens further away uh, we don't really know it could jump around and disappear or something but locally at least uh, it works does it make sense to you yeah uh, put some more simply, you could look at your z as a function of p given by these equations as uh, locally well-defined and differentiable. So you can work with this function and think of it as being uh, sm not necessarily smooth, but uh, at least differentiable. Okay. So we can have a look at uh, what this, um, what the Jacobian of... Um, R with respect to Z is for Kegeli conditions. Huh? So remember, uh, also Z is nicely behaved if uh, this matrix is full rank. So what is this matrix um, for um, the Kegeli conditions? Uh, it's this, right? You can verify that offline. And hopefully you recognize something here. Uh, we 
dealt with this matrix a lot in the Newton chapter. Uh, it's essentially the system or the matrix you would use in the Newton iteration to compute the solution. You remember that? Yeah. So when you do Newton on these KGD conditions, you will iterate on this linear system. So this matrix that you use in Newton, uh, it's also the matrix that tells us that Z as a function of P is locally well behaved. And there's a really interesting connection here. If this matrix was not full rank, then Newton would fail on the way, right? At some point, this matrix would not be invertible. You could not calculate your uh, primal dual updates in the Newton method. So the fact that Newton works properly and converges to your solution will also mean that uh, your uh, primal dual solution is uh, uh, locally well behaved, uh, differentiable and uh, like locally differentiable and uh, existing and so on. So you have really a relationship between these two guys. Um, and if you remember, we approached that question in Newton. Uh, this matrix is full rank if you have LICQ SOSC essentially. So if your solution to the problem has a LICQSOSC, then this, this matrix is full rank and Z as a function of P is, is nicely behaved locally. So it's uh, differentiable and so on and so forth. So, um, I mean, that kind of summarizes every uh, assumption you need in uh, parametric NLP is pretty much. That if you have a LICQSOSC, everything is uh, behaving well. Okay. That's nice, but the real question we have now is to actually calculate del W del P. Uh, that's the interesting uh, or useful thing. And there, um, I think I did that. I'm not sure if I did that, but uh, um, it's very easy to calculate um, del Z del P in, uh, in something like this. Um, so if you think about this, so Z is a function of P provided via this set of relationships. Um, so you could understand that as if I change P, Z as a function of P will change accordingly to keep satisfying this, uh, this uh, equations, right? That will be the case here. If I solve the problem for a P, I'll find a W lambda. I change the P a little bit, I'll resolve everything to get a new W lambda. So if I look at W lambda as functions of P, they will kind of move around so that they always satisfy these equations. That means if I uh, take a total derivative of this uh, R with respect to P, uh, that should be zero because the Z will always follow the parameters to satisfy the equations. And um, then I can do a chain rule to evaluate what that would be. Uh, I have uh, the influence of P via Z. So I have a del R, del Z, del Z, del P. And I then I have the direct influence of P on R. And this must be zero. Right, so that's how you get this kind of equation. Does that make sense? And then you, it's all about simply uh, like shuffling terms around. And that's pretty straightforward. But essentially, you get that del Z del P, how Z changes if P changes first order, is given by this thing here. <laughs> so you take del R del Z uh, at your solution, Z and parameter P, minus 1 times this guy here. That will tell you how um, Z changes with P. So if I show that a bit more visually, um, imagine that your z is a function of p like this and you have for example you solve the problem at some parameter p0 right and then you wonder how will my z change if i change the p so essentially you're asking what this tangent is uh, this is given by evaluating del r del z you evaluate this at your uh, point here. Call it Z0 if you want. Evaluate that Z0, P0, minus 1, del R, del P. Also evaluate it at 
z0 p0 with a minus. And that gives you this slope here, which means once you've solved the problem, you calculate that and it tells you locally how the solution will change if you change p. And here, actually, it's very easy to see why you need this matrix to be full rank. If it's not, then this inverse does not exist, so you cannot even compute del z del p. And if it's full rank, it guarantees that you can form this uh, this thing here. Okay with that? Yeah. Is it often full rank or is it? See it again. Does it normally become full rank, or is it very special cases? Yeah. So this um, del r del z. Um, so again, I have this matrix here, and uh, what we saw in the Newton chapter, or KKD chapter, I guess, uh, is that if you have LICQSOSC at the solution, then it will be full rank. And if it's rank deficient, that means your NLP has a deficiency at this point already. It's not LICQSOSC, so the solution is a little bit dodgy to start with. Okay. Um, yeah, so these are your sensitivity, so del z del p. Again, uh, z is your primal dual variable, so uh, you essentially get a picture of how w changes with respect to p, but also how the dual variables uh, change. And so your del r del z is given by the KKD matrix, essentially, and del r del z uh, is given by this sum, the uh, derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to w p and the sensitivities of the constraints with respect to p. Maybe one uh, interesting remark, if uh, the parameters p enter linearly into the constraints, then uh, this guy here is constant. Um, I guess it's kind of obvious. And one a thing important remark is that essentially building this comes almost for free in the sense that when you've run Newton, to get your solution z, you've basically made a suc <coughs> succession of factorizations of this matrix here. You have formed this matrix minus one times some stuff. If you hold this matrix from your iterations, reuse it in here, multiply by this guy, you get also the sensitivities of the problem. So when you've finished your Newton iteration, you keep that matrix uh, and multiply by this guy from the left. Um, yeah, and uh, from the right for you, and uh, you get the sensitivities of the solution for free. So if you need this thing here, just think that it costs pretty much nothing. Does it make sense? Yeah, you're reusing stuff that you have formed anyway for your Newton iteration. Any more explanation about that, or is it okay-ish? Okay, so here is what you can do, for example, for computing the sensitivity. So essentially that will be an algorithm that gives you the solution and the sensitivities of the NLP. So you will deploy Newton, so you need to form uh, this matrix, Kikini matrix minus one, call it M. And then you take the Newton step. So that's really uh, the classic uh, Newton on the Kikini conditions uh, that we discussed a few weeks ago. And uh, this is your classic Newton iteration that will give you or calculate your primal dual variables W and lambda, right? Maybe a bit of line search if needed with the, these T's to step size, uh, but that's basically what you will do. So you do your Newton iteration until you're happy about uh, your KKD conditions being satisfied. And once you're done, you keep the last matrix M that you've used and you multiply it by uh, this thing here that we had in the sensitivities. And that will give you how W and lambda could, would change with respect to P at this current point. So that's what you would have to do anyway to uh, calculate your solution. And you add this line of calculation and you get del W del lambda uh, del P. So the sensitivities are very cheap. Uh, one important remark is that if Newton has not really fully converged, uh, the matrix M is a little bit inaccurate. 
because it's not evaluated really at uh, an exact solution of the problem. So the sensitivities would also uh, become a little bit uh, inaccurate. Um, so in some papers, we uh, uh, play a bit with these notions. And uh, there are some tricks to uh, help handling these problems. Um, yeah, that's maybe not really important. OK with that? Was it more or less understandable? Uh, OK, but that's uh, a simple case. That's an NLP without inequality constraints. So now we can add um, H in the game. So the same construction, but if you have inequality constraints. And remember um, what uh, is likely to happen when you start putting inequality constraints in the game is that um, your Z of P uh, will typically look like this. So let's say you may have something like this whenever uh, constraints uh, become uh, weakly active. So when you have a change of active set, we'll have to understand uh, how we can describe this kind of manifold here, essentially. So we'll talk about the, the tangent to disguise and know that uh, at some points this tangent may, may be uh, strangely defined. And it's, it, always, it has always to do with this corner uh, in the um, complementary conditions. Uh, so the KKDs now, they look like this. They are more complex than before. And the fact that you have this kind of corners in W, it's also coming from the corner that you have in your equation. So it's no surprise at the end of the day that uh, you may have uh, strange things in your solution manifold when uh, knowing that we have this corner inside the equations anyway. So the KKD conditions, they are not smooth. Uh, we can in pre principle not differentiate them the way we have done it before, but they are piecewise smooth. So as long as we are not playing with that corner where you have weakly active constraints, that's why you have problems at these points, uh, you, can, uh, you can actually do something. And that will be basically the idea. Uh, when you have solved the problem, you will have picked a side in this, um, in this um, manifold, and then you can work with uh, sensitivities and derivatives, knowing that if, uh, if you start uh, going over this corner, then things uh, become a bit complicated. Um, and you can do something like this. Let's say that A is the active set of your uh, solution. So you calculate W, lambda, and mu, and you have certain constraints that are um, are uh, active, so this, some of these guys will be at zero. That's the set of indices. And you have this, uh, essentially these conditions that hold that uh, for a given active set. So these guys don't change. The age of index uh, in the set A are zero. And the mu's in the index set A bar, that's all the countries are not active, will be zero. And then you have these conditions here uh, that will essentially need to hold uh, in order for uh, this active set to be valid, right? Kind of recalls a little bit uh, what we did with the uh, active set QP solvers. But the point online is that now this, uh, these equations actually they fully define uh, W lambda mu and they are classic equations so I can use them as my R in, uh, in the IFT. So I can collect all these equations and form the IFT stuff uh, with these equations. So as long as all constraints are strictly active, we know that these conditions are supposed to hold at least locally. So uh, the W lambda mu, so your Z essentially, uh, is uh, implicitly defined by the P. OK. so. If I expand these conditions a little bit, that's my uh, nabla w l. It's made of these guys here. The rest is the same. Maybe I'll just finish this slide and then we take a break. Uh, so I will collect, um, I can do that actually. Um, I can uh, collect these three equations in, uh, in my R. 
I can put this one as well, but uh, it's basically defining uh, your mu a bar already, so I don't really need it. Uh, but I will use these equations to define my uh, w lambda and uh, mu, mu a, that is uh, non-zero. So that's my z. I can collect all these variables and the equations defining them in R. And then I just apply the implicit function theorem. So I need to build del R del z. It's given by this. And maybe you recognize, again, it's always the same matrix in the end, Hessian gradient of the constraints. We had this for the active set QP solvers, for example. Um, and then you can form this guy, the inverse, del R del P, and then get your sensitivities, del Z del P. So how W lambda and the mu corresponding to the active constraints will change as a function of P. If you use SQP methods with active sets QP solvers, you have this matrix uh, inside your QP solver, or you actually have the even a factorization of this matrix. You can go back to the lecture of yesterday where we did that. Um, so in principle, it's the same story as before. If you can retrieve this matrix from the QP solver at the solution, you could use it to build your sensitivities. Uh, the bad news is that uh, these people coding the QP solvers, they tend to hide everything from us. Uh, so we should lobby for uh, having access to this information. The work is done, you just want the numbers. So there's no reason for you to recompute that. But it's not always simple. Um, OK, we'll take a break. I'll keep talking about this later. <coughs>